Hey guys, Tarek Merryface here. Quick video. It's a lazy video, uh, but it's quite a long, so I'm going to make it as quick as I can. Uh, lazy slides and lazy planning, but let's do it. The new flight simulator. I'm so excited about it, and I've been watching loads of videos. And one of the videos I watched was from Frugal Sim. You know, Peter, uh, Pete, he does uh, awesome videos, uh, but he's not the most knowledgeable in terms of actual flying skills or being the ability of flying, that's fine because he makes really fun videos and I really enjoy them. Uh, but in one of them, he was making the Korshvel landing challenge. Well, he was trying the Korshvel landing challenge and, and then he flight sim. And he was basically making all the classical mistakes that someone could make when trying to land uh, in general and especially at a challenging airport like Korshvel. So I thought we could review the skills first with the theory and then with the practical side of things. And uh, yeah, copy paste from Google the, the images and that kind of stuff. So let's just get right into it. Understanding lift, a quick review. You've got the cord line, which is the trailing edge to the leading edge if you draw a line from the front to the back of the wing. Uh, and then that line has an angle relative to the flight path, the relative airflow. And then that angle is called angle of attack. Now, if we look here, uh, if you leave everything else constant, lift increases with angle of attack until we reach the critical angle of attack, which is where the wing stalls because the airflow no longer has enough energy to get over the uh, the top of the wing and becomes turbulent. So the thing to take here and uh, take into account here, because we're going very briefly into this, is that the stall is only dependent on angle of attack. Right, uh, you can be flying at any speed, but as long as the angle of attack is below the critical alpha, the wing won't stall. Okay, and uh, now you might be confused because you might think, well, we talk about stall speed. So why why angle of attack? Well, there's a video that I made, another lazy video, which you can watch by clicking the top right corner of your screen right now. Okay, final uh, graph, the thrust and drag curve, more I like to call it the Nike tick curve. And I want you to imagine or just look at drag and we're going to separate it into two components. Let's start with the obvious one, parasite drag. So as you can see, parasite drag is here. And so as we increase our airspeed, the amount of drag goes up and it's a square law. So if you double the airspeed, you you times the drag by four. Um, and so that's typically what we think about. It's the resistance of the atmosphere against movement. That's what parasite drag is. You move through the air, the air resists that motion. Induced drag is a little less obvious, and just to keep it simple, it's the drag induced by the very act of creating lift. Okay, And as you can see, it's a little different. At low air speeds, therefore at high angle of attacks, you're going to have a lot of induced drag. But as you accelerate, that induced drag drops off. Uh, and now if you combine these, so you add this plus this, this plus this, this plus this, this plus this, and so forth, you get this blue line, the total drag curve. And we say that's equals to the thrust required because it's the thrust required to equal that drag in order to maintain the speeds on that chart. So let's take it from a high speed. And that's why I like, to, by the way, I call it a Nike tick because of that shape. So if we, if we start at a high speed and then we want to reduce our airspeed, we reduce power to get reduced thrust. So we'll slow down until the thrust equals that drag. And then we reduce the thrust again and we get slower and slower and slower until we reach the point where the induced drag and parasite drag are the same. Now at this point, look at this. If you slow down, the amount of drag increases. So not only will you slow down, but the deceleration will increase, okay? So in order to maintain a lower airspeed then here, you're actually going to need to increase drag, okay? So that's what we call being behind the drag curve, when you need to increase power to maintain lower airspeeds. So once behind the drag curve, more power is needed. So why do we need to know this? Well, we'll see it in a second when we look at the practical aspects of flying, which is just about now. Now, something pilots can all agree is that altitude plus power equals performance. So you set the pitch at a certain attitude, you set the power at a certain setting, you're going to get a certain performance. Now where pilots disagree is what control, which controls what. Okay. 
Uh, and there are two schools of thoughts. And I know FAR Ames looks at one method, uh, and they think it should be the one method. I think it's a uh, FAA uh, pilot operating. I don't forget. I don't know the FAA uh, stuff. I'm more EASA. Um, anyhow, method one, which is what you would typically think of, it's more intuitive to use. You use power for speed and attitude for altitude. So, so you want to go faster. You increase power. You want to go up. You point up. You want to go down. You point down. Okay. So the advantage of that is more intuitive. And also you get more immediate effect. However, there is a certain loss of safety margin in terms of threat and error management. We'll cover that a little bit later. It's also quite hard to use when you're trying to make very small corrections because of secondary effects. Now the second method is to do the reverse. You change the speed by pitching up or down, or you change the power to climb and descend. Now, the advantage of that is for threat and error management, it is safer when you're flying at low speeds in terms of stall protection. It's also easier to make smaller corrections. <coughs> However, because we're essentially using secondary effects, it's, it's more difficult to make larger corrections, especially if you need to make them immediately, um, and thus a more delayed reaction. So now, which one should you use, method one or two? Well, I'm going to say this. Every pilot uses both methods, whether they like it or not, or whether they know it or not. And I'm going to give you some examples. And here's what I want to say. Method one is used for large changes, and method two is used for slow flight and small corrections. That should be a hint to how you're going to do that Courchevel challenge. Using method one, pat and apt, right? That's very typical how you learn how to climb and descend, right? So how do you start the climb? You add full power. Why do you do that? You want to minimize the airspeed loss. You then pitch to the attitude you're looking for. Yeah. So now you are pitching upwards to commence the climb you're using method one. And then you trim away the effort. At that point, you've used method one to commence the climb and to minimize the airspeed loss. You're using method one. So in the climb, however, you've got full power and you keep that constant. How do you control the airspeed? You control it with pitch. So now you're using method two to control the airspeed. How about coming out of the climb? You lower the nose to terminate the climb. So you're using pitch to control altitude. You wait until you're at cruise speed before you reduce the power. You're using power to control airspeed. We're using method one. Method two though, for example, the stall. The stall, as we mentioned earlier, is exceeding the critical angle of attack. So you pitch down. That's going to reduce the angle of attack and is going to increase the airspeed, which will allow us to maintain that reduced angle of attack. You're using pitch to control airspeed. But we also want to limit the amount of altitude we lost during that stall recovery. And we do that by adding power. So now we're using attitude to control airspeed, but you're using power to control altitude. Method two is also better for straight and level flight corrections. The rule of thumb is typically typically 100 RPM per 100 feet per minute. It's a rule of thumb, changes per aircraft, conditions, etc. Um, and then engine failure speed control, just like in the climb, right? If you've lost your power, it's constantly at idle or zero thrust. So how do you control the airspeed? You control the airspeed with pitch. Slow flight, that's the one where I personally find that there is no leeway i'm actually quite flexible on how people fly aircraft as long as they can control it and fly safely however think about slow flight let's say we are in the most dangerous situation we're low and we're slow and let's use method one let's say you're using method one and you want to correct the altitude first because you're low what are you going to do you're going to pitch up okay what is the problem with doing that the problem with doing that is that when you pitch up, you're going to quickly exceed the critical angle of attack. You're going to stall. And not only you're going to stall, you're going to stall at a low altitude. Now, let's say you want to correct the, uh, the airspeed first. So you're going to increase power. Now, what are the secondary effects, effects of adding power? You've got a pitching up moment and a left yawing tendency. Not only that, those effects are more prominent when you're in slow flight. The slower you fly, the more prominent those effects are. So now you're in a situation where you're close to alpha, 
you get a pitching up motion which will make you exceed critical alpha and you've got a left yawing tendency which will put you unbalanced or uncoordinated as the americans call it you are in a perfect situation for a speed for a spin that's why for slow flight i really recommend using method two because if you're slow how do you fix it you pitch down if you're too low how do you fix it you add power and that's why it's really important to use method two and slow flight okay now let's be more specific let's talk about using these in the courchevel challenge well method one for getting on final right the gross large corrections you're gonna point where you want to go and you're going to use the power to control your airspeed once you're established on final though it's time to transition to method two you're going to start using power to control your rate of descent and you're going to use pitch to control your airspeed so how fast should you fly well you're going to be flying at the very bottom of the wide arc so this these are screenshots from frugal's video right and you can see that his airspeed is way too high so we're going to have to go behind that drag curve. The, the minimum drag speed. So if I go back to that Nike tick uh, right here, uh, that speed is roughly around the best glide speed, right? So that's going to be for the DR400 and the Courchevel Challenge, 75 knots clean, 78 knots um, with flaps in. So once you go below the speed, you're going to be behind the drag curve. And that means you're going to need to use a lot of power. Okay, so going back to our slide, uh, there you go. We are way faster than that. So we're nowhere near the bottom of the wide arc. Okay. Now, you, one thing you might notice with this picture, if I do a close up, is that we can barely see the touchdown square. So how do you do that? Well, full flaps, right? If you reduce the flaps, you can fly the same speeds and the same descent rates at a lower angle of attack, which basically means you can pitch the nose down and you'll get better visibility out front. Um, now, Frugal didn't use flaps because he didn't know the DR400 have flaps. Easy mistake to make when you're playing in a flight simulator. You, you just want to do the challenge. You don't want to focus on, the, on the, the operation of the aircraft itself. Totally understandable. But yes, you have flaps in the DR400. Use them. Put full flaps in. Okay. So, are you high or are you low? Well, let's look at that picture. It looks like we're doing pretty well. Like Frugal is right on profile according to that, what, what, what you would think looking at that. But there's something called an optical illusion. There are multiple in flying. And this one is the upsloping optical illusion. When you're landing on a runway that's sloped upwards, it looks like you're too high because you can see more of the runway. Because of that, you have a tendency to come in a little too low. And that's exactly what Frugal has done. And you can tell by this hill right here in the corner. That hill is very close to the aircraft. You really should be a little higher, okay? So it should feel high in the Courchevel Challenge, okay? Right, so what's your aiming point? How fast should you descend? How should you tell? I want you to, to look first on the right side, uh, the top image, choosing an aiming point. This is really important. You need to pick an aiming point and keep it fixed so that you know where you're going to touch down. The thing to note is that you're going to be flaring. So once you've picked your aiming point, you're going to be touching down afterwards. How far down? Well, that depends on the amount of energy you still have to bleed off. And of course, the slope of the runway. So we're going on an upward sloping runway and we're going to be at a very low energy state. We're going to be close to the bottom of the white arc. So that means we're going to touch down very close to our touchdown, to our aiming point. So we don't need to go that far down. Maybe we can aim a little closer to the blue box. And the way to do that is basically just through experimentation. Now, how do you keep that aiming point fixed? How do you land on that point there? Well, you find your aiming point and you make sure that it's fixed. It's at a fixed distance above the dashboard of the aircraft. If that aiming point is moving down, it means your rate of descent is too low, you're getting too high. If it's moving up, then you're descending too fast, you're getting too low. And now if we now look at that GIF I made from Frugal's video, you can see the runway is actually moving down. Now what probably happened here is that Frugal realized he was too low like from the situation we had in the previous slide. Uh, let's keep playing that. Uh, and, so, and so he compensated 
by reducing the rate of descent, which is fine. The problem is he then kept it, so he ended up being a little too high. Okay, now one more thing I want to point out from that same video is I want you to look at the nose. Look what it does. Look at that pitch. See how it wobbles? This is classic. I see it all the time uh, with uh, student pilots. And that's because the aircraft isn't properly trimmed. Frugal is trying to maintain that back pressure to maintain the pitch that he wants. But he's in a situation where because he's not well trimmed, he's really working against it. He's, he's trying to fixate on the aiming point. He's trying to control the airspeed. He's trying to do all these things at once that he's going to lose track. And every now and again, he releases the stick, realizes he's getting he, his nose is dropping where it shouldn't be and pulling back up. The best way to fix this is to trim. Trim is your best friend. That's the second thing I say the most after more right rudder. So trim as much as you can. Every time you change the pitch, every time you change the power, every time you change, you change the flap configuration, every time you change what you're doing, follow it up with trim. It's going to reduce your workload. When you let go of the stick at any point in flight, it should be, the aircraft should stay exactly where it is to some extent, of course, turbulence, etc., being uh, a factor. Right, the flare. Now, this is a challenging one because we're going to be very close to the wide arc. We're going to be pretty much at the critical angle of attack. Not only that, we're landing on an upward slope. So as soon as we start flaring, we're probably going to stall. To make things worse, because we're going up a slope, we need to flare through a larger angle. We got to go through a further distance to get the main gears down before the nose wheel. So how can we compensate for that? And the answer is with power. With single engine propeller airplanes, adding power actually reduces your stall speed by a little bit. The other advantage is that it's going to cushion the landing. And remember, in this Courchevel challenge, we need to get a, a accurate landing. So landing in the blue box, we need to get a low rate of descent which is what we're aiming for here, and we need to get a short landing rollout. So flying on the wide arc, that's going to fix the landing rollout. Having the fixed aiming point, that's going to fix the accuracy of the landing. And then adding the power through the flare is going to help us smooth out that touchdown. One more. So I want you to look at Frugal's first attempt at landing it. And look at the flare. It's a 50% speed at the moment. So see how he's got a nice little flare there, but then he just drops the nose. Right, so what, he, what happened here is that he realized that he was going to miss the blue box, so he just shoved the nose down. That's, that's probably the worst thing you could do for a few reasons. First of all, it's going to result in a high rate of descent. Second of all, he's behind the drag curve. If he accelerates, it's actually going to reduce the drag, and he's going to land a little longer. Third of all, it's actually not great for the aircraft you could land on your nose wheel now yes it's simulator but it doesn't matter so the best thing you could have done is just kill the power a bit kept that nose up attitude let it sink and then add power just before the touchdown that's the best thing you could have done it this in reality the really the best thing you could have done is accept the, the lost distance the lost accuracy and just landed further down with a lower rate of descent okay so that's it guys I don't have the sim yet, which is why I'm not doing it in the simulator. I am so excited to fly this new sim. I am i can't wait to have it uh, in my computer. I've pre-installed it. I have done some s several pretty expensive upgrades for my computer. Um, and I'm just dying to try it out, counting down the days, less than a week away. Uh, and uh, if the Courchevel challenge is still there, that's probably the first thing I'm going to do. But anyways, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, make sure to comment in the section below. I'm Tarek Merryface. I'll see you guys next time, and happy flying.